Luigi's Mansion 2 is a game I've long had very mixed feelings on. It was my introduction to its series, and a game I always liked the idea of going back to, but I was never fully successful in doing so. After I played and fell head over heels in love with the original Luigi's Mansion, I was curious to see what other people thought of the long anticipated sequel. Despite the many issues I remember having with the game, I look back on it in hindsight as a very faithful sequel, but the general consensus I found online painted a very different picture. So many people have their issues with this game, and many of them would ask people like myself, how could we possibly think this was a faithful sequel when it's missing so many core pieces of the original's identity? How could it be faithful when it strays so far from the path of its predecessor? How could it be faithful when it's so damn different? So, I decided that the only way I was going to determine whether or not I really did stand by my opinions of this game was to play it again from start to finish. And I just couldn't wait a few months to do that on the Switch. Luigi's Mansion is one of the best games that Nintendo GameCube had to offer. It was a short little game, likely to only run you a couple of hours from start to finish, but what it lacked in its runtime, it made up for tenfold in its charm. This game ushered in a whole new era for Nintendo, and the creativity seeping from every individual pore of this game set the standard for what was to come. This was Nintendo's experimental era, where they threw caution to the wind and concepts at the wall to see what stuck. Every game they made for this system was unlike anything I've ever seen from this industry when it comes to just how off the wall they were with the core themes and concepts that their games were centered around. But because the story of most GameCube games starts the same way, with unprecedented creativity and a wholly unique basis, so too must their stories end the same way, with poor sales and falling to the wayside. And Luigi's Mansion, unfortunately, wasn't one to buck that trend. The game sold a modest 3.33 million units. Not bad for a brand new side series, but given the sales successes of the wider Mario franchise's entries on the same system, it's fair to say that this game didn't set the world on fire. Though it may shine bright among the most wonderful gems of this system's library, its results on the market failed to communicate that to Nintendo, and so the series was shelved until further notice. But that didn't mean that Nintendo didn't want to give this series another shot. After all, Pikmin released the very same year and sold about half as many units as Luigi's Mansion did, and yet it would see a sequel only two years later and a pair of enhanced ports on the next console. Say what you will about Nintendo, but financial failure isn't always enough for them to kill off a series entirely. If they see an opportunity to give a series another shot, they'll most often take it. For our darling Luigi's Mansion, that opportunity came around 10 years later with the launch of the Nintendo 3DS. When the original game was being developed, the team had the idea to implement stereoscopic 3D, but due to the cost of including the necessary hardware in every GameCube for the sake of enhancing only a small handful of titles, Nintendo ended up scrapping the concept. When brainstorming a successor to the Nintendo DS, the company ultimately decided that they wanted to give the stereoscopic 3D idea another shot, which would ultimately lead to the inception of the Nintendo 3DS and its main gimmick. So, with a system capable of stereoscopic 3D, Nintendo finally had the necessary tech to achieve their original vision for Luigi's Mansion. And so, a sequel was put into production to do just that. Luigi's Mansion 2 released for the 3DS a couple of months after the system itself did, and it finally gave this series the wider audience that it deserved, going on to sell over 5.4 million units. This game is considered a gem by so many people. But the thing is, it is a very different game than the original. There were fundamental changes made to the way this game was designed, to the extent that these two games arguably stand in stark contrast to one another. So, I want to know, do those differences make Luigi's Mansion 2 any less good than the original? And more importantly... That is the main question that I wanted to answer when replaying this game. That was the one thing about this game 
that I've always felt a little bit iffy on. The original Luigi's Mansion is designed in such an intriguing yet specific way that making alterations to the core formula has the potential to make a sequel feel too disconnected from the original game. Now, why am I saying all of this speculatively? Well, it's pretty simple. I haven't beaten this game in over a decade and I don't remember a great deal of its mechanics and gameplay sequences. I played the game around the time of its release and attempted to replay it many times afterwards, but I was never actually successful in doing so. I mean, don't get me wrong, I love this game. I've always just been too busy to give it my full attention. And if you don't believe me, check my diary. Hey, what's up, it's your boy, Rock. I'm not ready to give this game my full attention yet. Hey, what's up, it's your boy, Rock. I'm still not ready to give this game my full attention yet. Hey, what's up, it's your boy, Rock. I'm sorry, man. I'm just not ready to give this game my full attention yet. Hey, what's up, it's your boy, Rock. I'm finally ready to give this game my full attention. There are four key factors I intend to consider when answering the question of this sequel's faithfulness, and they're all areas in which I feel the original game excelled. I'm going to be considering Luigi's Mansion 2's story and setup, gameplay, atmosphere, and ghost design, and use its successes and failures in each department to determine whether or not I believe this game to be a worthy successor to the original GameCube gen. I'm not going to be using any sort of scoring system or anything like that here, but rather giving my opinions through the lens of my genuine reactions to replaying the game, as well as some more critical analysis here and there. So, with that being said, let's get right into it. Starting with... Luigi's Mansion 2's story is set in motion by the breaking of the Dark Moon, which was situated in the sky of Evershade Valley, where Professor Egad has come to conduct research. The Dark Moon breaking causes the ghosts in the valley to turn violent in a hurry, and the Professor uses his brand new gadget, the Pixel Shifter, to transport Luigi to his bunker. The two determine that in order to put the ghosts at ease, they're going to have to reassemble the Dark Moon by collecting each of its fragments that were strewn across the valley. Egad gives Luigi a pull gust and some not so encouraging words and our adventure begins. The basic story setup here is a lot different than the original, which is only natural for a sequel really, and I found this plot to be really enjoyable. Having a greater cause to work towards that works to serve a greater good is a compelling concept to play with in a game like this. And when tied with Luigi's usual timid, in over his head personality, led to an interesting plot to watch unravel. The idea of having to reassemble the dark moon so that the ghosts you encounter throughout the game can return to being friendly gave the game a much more real sense of motivation to me. It was a much more tangible goal than simply finding Mario, and gave a greater context as to why you're exploring the areas of this game. It also allowed me to connect with the ghosts more. They aren't just obstacles like they were in the first game, we're actively trying to save them and bring them back to their normal selves. The biggest difference in this game's setting compared to the original, though, is that Luigi's Mansion 2 does not just take place in the one mansion, and this this is where things get interesting. Luigi's Mansion 2 takes place across five different mansions, as opposed to the one found in the original game. Each of these locations is significantly smaller than that original mansion, but what they lack in scope, they make up for exponentially with variety. These locations are so cool. You have the Gloomy Manor, which plays on the same basic themes as the original game, with some fun twists, of course, but the rest of the mansions cover completely new and original themes. Haunted Towers is a mansion built around a giant tree, and it has a heavy thematic focus on plants and shrubbery. It has an overgrown aesthetic to it, which gives it a sense of age. It's desolate and left almost entirely to the flora within its walls. It was clearly used as a plant research facility, as there's greenhouses and scientific equipment all over the place. This mansion has such an interesting look to it, and it leans into the plant theming a really good amount. Old Clockworks is a tree being a timepiece factory that has long been abandoned, and it's also the oldest building in the game. The mechanical equipment found all throughout the building is really intriguing to me. The mansion has a very industrial setting, but there's an edge of unease that permeates throughout its halls. Despite 
Despite it being the longest standing structure in the game, the industrial theming elicits feelings of a much more modern age, which contrasts nicely with the desert theming that's also found through the mansion. A lot of the rooms are filled with sand, which kind of felt odd to me at first, but I actually ended up feeling like it mixed with the industrial theming really nicely. It gave this mansion something of a steampunk feel to it. Now, Secret Mine is really something special. Oh, this is cool. Oh, this is cool. <laughs> oh, oh, I think I might have already found a favorite mansion. Holy shit. Yeah. Yeah, this theming really does it for me. This is an exceptionally interesting setting for this game. This mansion is set in a mining site situated at the top of some snowy mountains, and much like the old clockworks, they've been entirely abandoned. I can't really put my feelings about this mansion into words eloquently, but something about the typical dark broodiness of this game, mixed with the snowstorm and related aesthetics of this mansion, work for me on such a deep level. The chalet, which seems to have remained relatively untouched in the years since the operation's collapse, the gondola system that's in a complete state of disrepair, the constant blizzard and high-rise piles of snow that bring a sense of confinement to the environment, it's all so provocative. The mansion elicits such strong feelings within me. It's by far my favourite location in this game. Last, but certainly not least, the Treacherous Mansion is probably the most traditional mansion setting we've seen since Gloomy Manor, but it has some really fun twists. The mansion contains a lot of exhibits, allowing it to have multiple different themes all in one. Practically every room has a different theme to it, and while some of them fall a bit short. I still found this to be a fun enough concept to play with. It provoked images in my mind of an eccentric billionaire who was immensely proud of his lavish displays, despite the fact that there was rarely anyone around to see them. There's nothing actually in the game that points to that being the case, that's just where my mind goes. However, I feel like the jumble of loads of different themes kind of makes this mansion feel a bit unfocused, and it almost left me feeling like it was the weakest location the game had to offer. But the the final act of the game really allowed this mansion to shine. Throughout the game's story, we're able to view security images that clue us in on what's going on in each mansion, and there are a few not-so-subtle clues that point us in the direction of King Boo being the force behind Evershade Valley's disturbances. This all culminates in the treacherous mansion, where King Boo opens up an interdimensional portal that sets hordes of ghosts free into the valley, and this is genuinely one of the single best moments in the entire game. Game, but more on that later. Naturally, we defeat King Boo and restore order to Evershade Valley, and seeing the ghosts return back to their normal, friendly personalities was such a cool moment. It was expected, yes, but it still capped off this game's story really nicely. The story and setup of Luigi's Mansion 2 are fantastic. The game being split up into five separate mansions felt to me at first like it would be changing the formula a bit too much for me to see it as a natural progression, but that idea thoroughly fell to the wayside mere moments into the second mansion. The variety in locales and theming that this setup affords honestly feels like the most obvious way in which this sequel could improve upon the original. Like, yeah, of course they moved from one mansion to five. What else would they have done? And I think that comes down solely to the execution of the concepts at play, as well as how wholly unique each of the mansions is. And the same can be said for the story, honestly. Again, it's pretty predictable, and doesn't stray too far from the path of its predecessor, but it has a lot to offer in spite of that that makes it stand out, which is only elevated by the game's layout. The gameplay of Luigi's Mansion 2 is one of the biggest fundamental changes from the original game. Luigi's moveset and ability to traverse the locations in this game has been completely overhauled, and nowhere is this more obvious than with the inclusion of a run button. Luigi's walking speed in this game is a lot slower than in the first game, granted, but the run button grants Luigi a much more comfortable speed for getting around the world. Okay, fine. Maybe that isn't the most obvious change. In 
this game, Luigi is equipped with the Poldergust 5000, a new and improved version of the Poldergust 3000, equipped with a bevy of new features. When attempting to suck up a ghost, there's now a meter that gets filled over time. If you're able to fill the meter all the way up, you can unleash a pulse of energy that wipes out a huge amount of the ghost's health. The way you deal damage and build up that meter is exactly the same as in the first game. You push the control stick in the opposite direction of the ghost. But man, the 3DS's circle pad is not built for this kind of gameplay. It's fine in smaller encounters or with ghosts with lower health, but if you're fighting loads of different ghosts and a lot of them have a lot of health, it is just not comfortable. And if you're anything like me, the little nub on your 3DS's circle pad will just fall off mid-battle. I mean, I've seen two, but... But you... What the fuck? My... Ah, my nubs fell off! <laughs> fuck! Where... Where... My knob keeps falling off. <laughs> My 3DS is not, it, it's not built for Luigi's Mansion 2. That knob, get back on. You can also jump whilst the meter is building, but I genuinely forgot that was something you could do. Never really felt that beneficial. Luigi's flashlight has also received an upgrade, the strobulb. This allows Luigi to build up a large flash of light that stuns the ghosts. This is now the only way to weaken a ghost and open them up to being sucked. So being able to attack a foe is now a little bit harder, but in my opinion, this is an objectively superior way of handling combat. Having much more direct control over your flashlight made me feel much more capable capable in combat, and I actually found it to add a layer of strategy to the combat, figuring out when would be the optimum strategy to let a charging flash rip based on what the ghosts were doing. Outside of combat, Luigi can also utilize the dark light, which can reveal invisible objects in the environment and make them visible if you're able to catch all of the balls they emit. And yes, I said catch, not suck, I didn't want to go for the low hanging fruit. So instead, I'll advise you to check your low hanging fruit regularly. It could save your life. It's usually pretty obvious when something in the environment is missing, due to the shadow still being present, but there are a lot of times when it can be really hard to spot, which turns this from a situational tool at best into something I genuinely found myself using very often just in case I'd missed something interesting. All of these additions to Luigi's moveset are sublime. They add a layer of complexity to the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay that made it really captivating to me. Having so many tools at your disposal made the gameplay feel really fresh. Things never got stale. They didn't in the first game either, don't get me wrong, but Luigi's Mansion 2 boasts a much longer playtime than its predecessor. So I feel that the added depth and variety in the available moveset helps to ensure that the gameplay remains interesting throughout the entirety of that runtime. All of the new moves on offer become second nature, apart from the jump, and they feel like such natural extensions of Luigi's capabilities from the first game. Now, the move set on offer here is one thing, but I'd argue an even more important aspect of the gameplay experience is the structure that that gameplay takes place in. We've already talked about the multiple mansion structure, but how do we go about conducting our business within those mansions? Well, the answer to that question is one of three major points of contention with Luigi's Mansion 2. This game utilises a mission structure. And I don't know how to feel about it. Each of the mansions in the game are split into usually five or so missions and a boss fight. Each of the missions are completely self-contained with a definitive goal and end point. They each see you traversing to different parts of the mansions to accomplish certain tasks, and some of them even change up the environments compared to other missions. A lot of people feel like this structure absolutely does not belong in a Luigi's Mansion game. So let's quickly break down why. One could very easily make the argument that the original Luigi's Mansion has a mission structure. You have set tasks to carry out, and each of them is fairly self-contained, and you're able to roam the mansion freely during said task. You can still explore the mansions in the sequel during any given mission, but unless you're specifically signposted to a particular area, it 
doesn't often serve much of a beneficial purpose. However, I'd argue the biggest difference here is that the first game is non-linear, at least to some degree, but that couldn't be farther from the truth with the sequel. These missions are sequential and linear, with no overlap. So there's no wandering into one room and stumbling across a new objective like in the first game. I can absolutely see why many people think this structure doesn't fit with the series, but the developers believed that laying the game out this way would make it much better suited to handheld play. Being able to have smaller objectives that are much more clearly defined was intended to make the game more easily digestible, and even the people who don't like the structure can at the very least agree that it achieves that pretty well. So where do I sit in this discussion? In a different fucking room than everybody else. I really like the mission structure here. I don't think it's perfect, and it definitely opens the door for some annoyance, which we'll get back to in just a little bit, but I actually think that on the whole, dividing the game up into these self-contained chunks works really well, and complements the gameplay quite nicely. However, as I got further and further through the game, I began to realise something. I don't think the mission structure accomplishes what it wants to at all, actually. I don't... Yeah, I don't think it does what it sets out to do in the fucking slightest. This structure does not achieve what it's intended to achieve in my opinion, and I would be delighted to tell you why. Each of the missions throughout the game, with a few exceptions, are likely to run you a minimum of around 20 minutes to complete. That on its own really doesn't sound too bad, but in order for your progress in a mission to actually save, you have to beat said mission. So let's say you're in the car for a 10 minute journey and decide to start a new mission. Nine times out of 10, you'll be halfway through the mission by the time you reach your destination. And if you aren't able to continue until the end, you've lost all of that progress. This feels like a baffling conflict to me. I mean, it didn't affect me at all because I spent 14 hours in the same chair playing this game, but even just knowing what they were intending to achieve with this structure made it really hard for me to ignore how it fails. And don't even get me started on what happens if you die during a mission. Yeah, you have to do the whole thing again. Doesn't matter how far through a mission you are, you could be in the very last encounter and if you die, you're doing it all over again. No. Yeah, no! Fuck it, what? Are you serious? Restart mission? Like, from the start? Restart? Like, from the start? Restart? There's no fucking way. There's no fucking way. You piece of shit. Oh my god. No. How much progress have I just lost? Oh, you asshole. I'm just going to say it straight up. I do not think the mission structure complements handheld play in the slightest. And if that was its only goal, you have to wonder whether it was worth implementing in the first place. If you aren't me. Even if it fundamentally fails to achieve the single thing it was designed to achieve, I think the mission structure actually works to the game's overall benefit, which is a really confusing thing to be feeling. I don't know, I just... I liked how the game was structured. I liked having those little boxes to tick. I liked seeing how each mission would switch things up and utilize different parts of the mansion than the last. It really kept me on my toes. Each of the missions also has a boo to track down. And if you're able to find all of the boos throughout all of the mansion's missions, you then unlock a bonus mission, which is essentially just a battle rush, where you have to fight all of the ghosts in the mansion in a certain time limit. But if we're gonna talk missions, I'd be remiss if I didn't take some time to discuss the second major point of contention with this game. What's up? Professor Egad never leaves you alone. 
Never! This was actually one of the only parts of the game that I actively disliked more in my most recent playthrough. I remember specifically thinking about it last time I played this game. I thought, no, oh, it's not that bad. People are really blowing this up. But no, it is constant. Oh, and of course. Yes, that's what I mean. I, and he's back. He's back again. <sighs> he got. <laughs> Oh, what do you want? So, if I know this game... <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was about to say. So I do know this game. And it's not even like he has anything useful to say most of the time. If he had valuable input, it'd still be too much. But you'll like beat a ghost and get a key, and then you hear the dun 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 dun, and then Egad says, hey Luigi, you should use that key. And then you go to the door to use the key, and then a cutscene happens where a ghost does a bad, and then dun 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 dun, and Egad says, blast that darn ghost, and he shows you where it went on the map, so that then you go find and defeat the ghost and dun 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 and yes my boy now you can use the key and shut up it can be fucking infuriating just how many times egad wants to call you to say nothing i think the most frustrating thing egad does though is call you at the end of each mission this is fine in concept and works for what the game is going for, but he far too often does this way before I'm ready for him to. I'll spot something in the room I'm in that I want to investigate and then I'm bringing you back. Hold on tight. No, I didn't want to go back. I didn't get to interact with anything else in this room. Fuck's sake, Egad. It'll be faster for me to bring you back here and then send you to the what no 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 don't send me back there was a whole door there was a door I didn't go in Egad Oh my god this is probably my biggest issue with the mission structure. The fact that you have no direct control over when a mission ends. I get that once you've finished up the main task, the mission should draw to a close. But sometimes it's something completely unexpected that ends up triggering Egad's call, and it makes reaching the end of the mission significantly more annoying than rewarding. The boss missions are some of my absolute favorite parts of this game. They're all so incredibly unique and add a fun spin to the established gameplay that really shakes things up. My absolute favorite example of this was the Secret Mines boss. It turns the game into a first person shooter where you have to aim bombs at the boss to break through his defenses. It was incredibly fun. Or at least it was until... What do you mean? What, 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 what do you mean? What do you mean? What, 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 what? No, what the what, 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 fuck you! <laughs> Eat my bombs, please, not me. Fuck. Oh, I beg this of you. Oh, my my God. God. Luigi's Mansion 2's core gameplay experience, that's upside down, is an improvement over the originals in almost every conceivable way. And even though the structure in which that gameplay is delivered to us does have its flaws, I'd argue that it serves the game in a beneficial way. It might not feel like an evolution over the first game, but it is still very, very enjoyable. All right, we've got the two biggest aspects of the game over and done with. So now it's time to delve into the smaller stuff. One of the biggest reasons I love Luigi's Mansion on the GameCube so much is its atmosphere. The aged decor that sparks imagery of a bygone era. The way the mansion manages to feel so lived in despite just how long it's been abandoned. The eeriness that a lot of the environments are able to elicit, it's all so intoxicating to me. So I'd expect a sequel to at the very least meet that same standard. Unfortunately though, Luigi's Mansion 2 has a very different visual style 
that doesn't really lend itself all that well to the same vibes that the original game was able to capture. Luigi in the first game, all things considered, looked pretty off model, but the world around him was much more realistic and detailed, which made that a lot less jarring. Here though, Luigi is exactly how you'd expect him to be. He looks exactly as he does in every other Mario game. So naturally, the world around him accommodates for that. The environments in this game have a much more cartoony edge to them. The lines in the architecture are never perfectly straight, giving the structures a disarming imprecision, which is a far cry from the much more deliberate and intricate design found in the first game. It's something I feel is very subtle, but because of the expectations I had for this game that were firmly set in stone by its predecessor, it really stood out to me. The music is definitely something that aids in this too, as the melodies present definitely have a softer, more light-hearted feel to them. They rarely work to heighten tension, except for in some of the bigger moments and cutscenes, but rather, they work with the environments and enhance the tone they're hoping to set. I'm not saying for a second that the atmosphere present in this game is bad, but it's definitely different than the original. It lacks a certain edge that that game had and substitutes it for something a tad more jovial. But you know what? that opens the door for some immaculate comedic moments. I mean it, this game can be downright hilarious at points. It plays a lot with slapstick, almost Looney Tunes level shenanigans from the ghosts, and contrasts that with some surprisingly dry wit from Professor Egad. And the ways in which Luigi interacts with each of these things can be pure gold. I had many laugh out loud moments during my playthrough, and they honestly took me completely off guard. And when I realized that comedy took precedent over spookiness in this game, I was able to look at what I previously believed to be failings of the game's tone in a new light. The environment being more cartoony and waggy works to heighten the comedy. If you had an environment just as intricate and visually striking as the original game, and then had the ghosts getting bonked on the head by a rake in the very same place, it would probably feel jarring. I think the ending, where the ghosts all return to normal, perfectly encapsulates the tone that this game is going for. The stakes had never been higher than in those final moments of the battle against King Boo. And then almost immediately afterwards, the ghosts return to unadulterated wackiness. And it's oddly beautiful. When I was able to look at the game from this new perspective, I actually found myself impressed by the few moments where there was a legitimate, tangible sense of tension and atmosphere. A particular highlight for me was right near the end of the game, after King Boo unleashes the horde of ghosts into the treacherous mansion. The music, the stakes of the situation, everything works together to paint a beautiful scene with a real sense of urgency and consequence. And this is capped off so spectacularly by strikes of purple lightning that illuminate the halls of the manor. I can't express how cool the purple lightning is. I love it so much. It's wonderful. The presence of the provocative purple works to consistently reinstate the fact that we are currently dealing with stakes of multi-dimensional proportions. This is such a big moment in the game and its world and everything falls onto the shoulders of our reluctant hero. Those visually stimulating accents to this part of the game work on such a deep level for me. Admittedly, this could come from a place of bias, as I do love myself some purple lighting to evoke spooky feelings, but I genuinely think it heightens these moments in such an unexpected way. And that right there, that's something Luigi's Mansion 2 deserves credit for. Its atmosphere may not be exactly what I'd be looking for in a sequel to Luigi's Mansion, but it manages to pull off two opposite ends of the spectrum of tone so incredibly well. There's an argument to be made that it maybe leans a bit too far into the comedic aspects, but I personally feel that it offers a nice balance between the two, which helped keep things interesting throughout the entire runtime. <laughs> Thank you. 
the enemy designs in a game may not immediately stand out as one of the most important aspects to consider, but when you're following up a game that delivered some genuinely thought-provoking character design, I'd say it's a pretty crucial thing to nail. Much like with the world this game is set in, Luigi's Mansion 2's ghosts have a much more cartoony style to them. I think part of this comes down to their story significance. These are friendly ghosts at the end of the day, so their designs have to fit that description at least somewhat. You combine that with these guys being the main vehicle for comedic moments, and it just makes sense for them to have a little less edge to them than their predecessors. For what it's worth though, I still think these are some fantastic designs for ghosts, and they all portray their respective personalities really well. The greenies have a soft, playful look to them, which indicates to the player that these are the low level ghosts. They'll still put up a fight, they're more than just Goombas, but they're your easiest foe to defeat. That non-specific design does open the door for them to have multiple variations though, and we see that a lot throughout the course of the game. They can wear sunglasses, wield shovels and swords and shields, be mummified, wear helmets, and all of these things and more change up the way you approach them in battle. Slammers have a very gruff appearance to them, signifying that these are much more brutish ghosts. They're some of the strongest ghosts in the game and will not hesitate to dish out heavy hitting blows, but that aggression does often come at the expense of strategy. Hiders, as their name suggests, are very much the opposite of slammers. Their slim, lanky appearances tell the player that they're easily able to slink away undetected and slip out of your grasp if you aren't careful, and their cheeky grins communicate that they can and will cause trouble for you from afar. Poldergeists, or as they're called in the the British version, boffins, which has just fantastic mouthfeel, are ghosts that you'll encounter fairly infrequently, but they're very, very strategic and possess many skills that your average run-of-the-mill ghosts don't, as indicated by their disproportionately large head. They're smart and they know it, but their arrogance can be their downfall in a lot of cases. Gobbers are my least favourite ghosts in the game. As their gargantuan size would suggest, they are absolute tanks and can't be moved by your Poldergust for love nor money. This works to their advantage and allows them to spit large clumps of goo directly at you, which can be extremely hard to dodge. These ghosts are at their most devious when it's not just a one-on-one. -on -one. If there are other ghosts present, these guys are a nightmare to deal with. Creepers are a adorable, which nicely reflects how non-threatening they can be. Their default state is a purple puddle, which in some lights can be pretty difficult to spot, and if you fail to see them, you'll end up caught in their grasps, desperately mashing the A button to be set free. But if you don't end up falling into their trap, they are the single easiest ghost in the game to defeat, and their face alone should have been enough to clue you in on that. The final main ghost type is Sneakers, who have such a mischievous look about them that I can't help but find them endearing. These ghosts just love to sneak up on Luigi and give him a big ol' scare, which can interrupt any attacks you're currently carrying out, which can therefore make these ghosts a real pest to deal with. The ghosts in this game all have such fantastic designs in my opinion. They aren't particularly subtle or intricate, I'll give you that, but they absolutely achieve what they were intended to. However, while the ghost designs that are present are very strong, those that aren't present are the third and final major point of contention with Luigi's Mansion 2. What could I be referring to, you may ask? The complete and utter lack of portrait ghosts. This, for me, was one of my single biggest worries with Luigi's Mansion 2. The portrait ghosts were such an integral part of the first game's identity. They were one of the major things that gave that game its charm. How do you make a Luigi's Mansion game without portrait ghosts? You just kind of do it. I want to preface this by saying, I get it. I absolutely understand how not having portrait ghosts would be enough for most people to disregard this game as a faithful sequel entirely. But here's the thing. In the moment to moment gameplay, when I'm immersed and invested in what I'm doing and the fun I'm having with this game, 
it's honestly something I didn't really notice. Which is weird, right? Because on paper, I'm fully on board with the notion of the absence of portrait ghosts being absolutely ludicrous. On paper, this seems like a deal breaker. But in practice? didn't find it to be that big of a problem. In hindsight, I can absolutely look at moments from the game and imagine how they would have been enhanced by the presence of a portrait ghost. The eccentric billionaire that I've chosen to imagine decked out the treacherous mansion could have been such a cool addition to that area. Or maybe there was a portrait ghost for each exhibit. In the secret mines, there could have been an old miner dressed from head to toe in snow gear to help brace the storm. Gloomy Manor could have had a science professor who worked alongside Professor Egad in his research. There is so much potential. But that just did not occur to me in the moment. I was too engaged by what the game was already offering me that this massive omission didn't even cross my mind. At least, for most of the game. There was one particular encounter that struck me as incredibly jarring given everything we've just discussed. And that was the fight against the three sisters. These ghosts are gardeners found in the haunted towers. And for all intents and purposes, they are portrait ghosts. They have unique designs, unique backstories, and a unique boss fight. They are absolutely everything a portrait ghost is and should be. But they're the only ones. The devs were very clearly capable of implementing a conceptual alternative to portrait ghosts that fit into and expanded the world of this game tenfold. And they only chose to do it once. And that is so confusing to me. I should be grateful that they gave us at least one portrait ghost, but I'm sorry. I just can't feel that way. Them being here, and being the only portrait ghosts in the game, it honestly gave me whiplash. They were such a fun encounter, and yet, them being as jarring as they are kind of made me dislike it. It just worked to show me that the devs could have given us portrait ghosts, but ultimately, decided not to. That was the single instance in which I actively disliked the lack of portrait ghosts. But outside of that sequence, they didn't really cross my mind much at all. What the game did offer was so unique and so incredibly enjoyable that I don't even notice the ways in which this game falls flat compared to its predecessor. It goes for something very, very different than the original game, but it pulls it off to near Perfection. And that, right there, is exactly why I feel that Luigi's Mansion 2 is an incredibly faithful sequel. It doesn't follow the same template as the original, and it doesn't include a lot of things that many people feel are core parts of the Luigi's Mansion experience, but it does evolve the series in some really significant ways, and all of the things that it does try? it's pretty damn successful at. I think I still prefer the original, but Luigi's Mansion 2 matches that game's enjoyability with ease. So really, how could it not have been a faithful sequel? Luigi's Mansion 2? It's an incredible game. And I can't wait to buy and play it all over again.